Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome again to the new lecture of the course, Fundamentals and Applications of Dielectric Ceramics. So, in the previous lecture, uh, let us just recap the previous lecture. So, in the previous lecture, we talked about, uh, we started our discussion on dipolar polarizability. So, basically alpha d, so where we take the case that you know, if you have electric field line like this, then dipoles are making a cones at an angle theta with respect to applied field. So, this is first cone, you might have another cone at another angle. So, basically all these dipoles then need to be, uh, so this is an angle theta 1. So, you need to basically calculate the average dipole moment, which is basically total dipole moment of the system. divided by number of dipoles. That is what we did. So, we, we took a slightly angular analysis considering the solid angle and then we also took help, help of Boltzmann distribution function which allows us to get the minimum free energy because Boltzmann allows function said that number of dipole moments of energy u u theta will be equal to a into exponential of minus u theta divided by k t. So, this avoids the calculation of entropy which may be a little trickier. So, from this we calculated what is the average dipole moment. So, the average dipole moment was calculated as uh, mu into um, beta. Okay and uh, this uh, beta was meet beta sorry l beta and this l beta was basically langevin function and langevin function uh, at at low value of beta so beta will be equal to here mu e divided by kt so at low beta that is um, low field or high temperature, we can approximate it L beta is equal to beta divided by 3 and from this we got mu e which is equal to 1 over 3 mu square e divided by k t. Okay. So, from this we determine what is dipolar polarizability which is alpha d and this is 1 over 3 mu square divided by KT. So, what it means is that basically dipolar polarizability decreases as you increase the temperature. This is the analysis that we did and this is dependent on temperature unlike the other two polarizabilities that are electronic and ionic uh, in polarizabilities. So, for example, if you do it for a system such as uh, if you take for HCL for example, so, imagine that electric field is equal to about 100 mega, mega volt per centimeter, dipole moment is about 10 to the minus 29 coulomb meter, then at a temperature of 300 Kelvin, we get a beta of about 2.24, which is sort of okay, because we considered beta to be smaller than 1. So, this sort of validates the analysis, that approximation was not wrong. However, if you do for example, at a temperature like 30 Kelvin, then this increases the beta value to 2.4. So, that sort of invalidates our analysis, but the problem, but what happens is that at 30 K HCl, so at this form HCl is liquid, right. So, all the dipoles are randomly oriented, but here HCl becomes solid. Basically, in solid form, if you have this kind of situation, then the dipoles tend to cancel each other. It becomes a basically, you have ionic polarization only that contributes. So, as a result, the dipolar polarizability is not valid at uh, lower temperatures. It is only the ionic polarization that contributes for the HCl because it is in solid form. So, sort of NaCl structure it makes. 
So, now let us, uh, so what we have done just to summarize now, uh, you, so you have three polarizabilities, you have ionic polarizability, putting everything together which is alpha electronic, which is basically proportional to R cube, but is not a function of temperature, sorry electronic, it is electronic. Then we have ionic polarizability. So, this is electronic polarizability is true for every system because every system will have atoms. Ionic polarizability is only for uh, ionic solids where we have cations and anions in the solid form. There we consider alpha i and this is proportional to 1 over y, but again it is not a function of temperature. Electronic and then we have dipolar polarizability, this is for polar molecules only where molecules have dipole moment, there we define this as alpha d and this is proportional to 1 over t. So, this is a function of temperature and it decreases as the temperature increases, which means you need to apply larger field to polarize the system. Okay. So, <clears throat> that is why you will see in every system the polarization decreases as you increase the temperature in where, whether it is a ferroelectric system, piezoelectric, uh, pyroelectric system or any other system. The thermal randomization takes over uh, as you increase the temperature the, and as a result you have decrease in the polarization or dipole moment of the system. So, can we hear in terms about the extent required to polarize our material? Can we? In terms here from the dipolar polarization, yeah. how much extent is required? Yeah, I mean, uh, so basically this analysis should be reasonably correct. If you have, uh, if you know the value of uh, T and if you wanted to create certain sort of, uh, some sort of dipole moment, uh, then you can to some extent get a feel of what should be the electric field that you require to polarize the system to create some amount of dipole moment. So, as I said p is equal to n mu square e divided by 3 k t. So, but this is this is this is not valid for nonlinear effects where you have interaction between the dipoles. So, here we are not we are assuming that dipoles are non interacting, okay. but if dipoles start interacting then it is a different situation, but yeah to a, to a first approximation for a system where you have non-interacting dipoles you can do that. And in a, in a normal solid you will also have effect of grain boundaries as well as defects that sort of complicate the scenario, but yeah I mean it may give you an idea of what is that which is required to polarize the system. Now let us move on to, so what we have done until now is that we have looked at the basic dielectric properties, what is polarization, what is the mechanism of polarization, what is the electric constant and what is the frequency dependence of dielectric constant as a function of uh, under uh, and looked at in the context of various mechanisms, which mechanisms are operative in which frequency range and then we looked at a parameter called as polarizability and its analytical treatment and we found that ionic and electronic polarizabilities are independent of temperature. whereas dipolar polarizability for polar molecules is dependent upon temperature. So, what we are going to do now is that we are going to look at the frequency dependence of these dielectric properties in a little bit more detail because this is what is of interest practically speaking because most dielectrics are used in applications at requiring certain frequencies of electric field. So, now our discussion will be towards studying frequency dependence of dielectrics. So, here I mean the first thing that we are going to look at uh, some fundamentals. So, so we will first look at uh, the comparison between ideal and real. So, this also, so this gives you basically good information about how good your dielectric is, how close are you to making a real dielectric. Basically a real dielectric is something where dielectric by nature should be insulator. So, which means there should be no whatever you 
whatever electric field you apply to it, all the current, all the electric field should be used in uh, creating the electric displacement that is the polarization and uh, you should not lose any charges out from the system. But systems are not perfect, they have various defects and things like that as a result whatever current you produce should be charging current ideally, but it is not charging current. There is a component which is called as leakage current that is produced and as a result some of the charges that you polarize leak out of the system as a result you have loss of uh, information or loss of anything in, in terms of charges. So, this is what is important, uh, this, is, this is what makes it important to understand the frequency dependence of dielectrics because it, 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 it gives you parameters which, have, which can be depicted in the form of um, frequency dependent behavior. So, let us look at first the behavior of a real dielectric. All right. So, basically for most applications we do not require a static or DC field, for most applications require an AC field, okay. so which means frequency is not equal to 0, it is finite and as a result, so let us apply first, let us, uh, so the field is is a sinusoidally varying field, let us say this field is V is equal to V naught into exponential of I omega t. Okay. So, if V naught is V is equal to V naught exponential I omega t and if we apply this voltage to a dielectric, this leads to, so apply it to, to a dielectric and this should give you what we call as charging current and this charging current is basically the rate of change of charge basically dq by dt. So, this I c is nothing but dq divided by dt and we know that q can be written as c into dv by dt. So, this will be equal to I omega into C V okay. and uh, if you now do a little bit of, so this is omega C into V naught into exponential of I omega T and let us say I add a factor exponential of I pi by 2. Okay. So, this, this will become, I can write this as omega c into v naught into exponential of i into omega t plus pi by 2. All right. What does this mean? This means that this term pi by 2 basically means that the current, char the charging current in a dielectric leads the voltage by an angle. 90 degree or pi by 2 in a perfect dielectric. So, for a perfect dielectric, if you now make the phasor diagram as we call it, if this is the voltage vector, then the current leads the voltage by an angle 90 degree and this is, okay. this is what is a simple current voltage relationship for a perfect dielectric. So, this is for a perfect dielectric where the current leads the voltage by 90 degrees. So, as long as the current is at certain angle at, an, at a voltage 90 degree, it is perfect dielectric. In reality, what you see is that in reality, the current does not lead the voltage by, it leads the voltage by a angle theta. As a result, there are two components. One is this component, which is in the charging current direction and then you have another component, uh, sorry, just I can draw it here maybe. So, this component is a charging component and this component is within the direction of voltage is the loss component, the ohmic loss component because for a ohmic, ohmic loss when the, when the current is in the direction of voltage which means it is a ohmic current and the current is in the direction perpendicular to the voltage is the charging current. 
So, total current has now two components for a per real dielectric and that is what we will see how it comes about, how do you have. So, anyway, so for a perfect dielectric basically uh, the current leads the voltage by 90 degree and this is total current and this all of this current is basically charging current. Okay. And what is the now in such a dielectric what is power dissipation? So, power dissipation in such a dielectric would be so instantaneous power that is drawn by the dielectric is basically I c into V. Okay. So, the time averaged power now that is P average is 1 over time period integration over the time period into I c into V into d t. Okay. So, this is the time averaged power where time period is given as 2 pi divided by omega. Okay. So, omega is the frequency of applied field. So, for an ideal dielectric, so I can probably write it here just to save some space. So, this is given as 2 pi divided by omega. So, for an ideal dielectric, with no loss of charging current basically ideal dielectric there is no loss of charging current no charges are lost so basically the current you have is only charging current we don't lose it in some other form the power dissipated must be equal to and what is it this is equal to 1 over time period integrated reform this is for minus omega c into V naught square sin omega t to cos omega t into d t that is equal to 0. Okay. You can write it in exponential forms whatever you want, but this is so if you take V is equal to V naught sin omega t then you can calculate I c from this. So, that will be sin omega t will plus pi by 2. So, as a result you will have sin pi by 2 cos pi by 2 factor uh, sin omega t and cos omega t, but you can also write this in the form of exponential form and you will get the same answer. So, this power loss this power average power dissipated in a, a ideal dielectric should be equal to 0 for a. So, what it means is that uh, during the first cycle when you charge the capacitor completely the second cycle discharges the capacitor without any loss of charge. So, during the first cycle, so if this is the cycle you have, this is the first cycle, the charging cycle and the discharging cycle, the charging cycle and the discharging cycle. So, the charge in is equal to, so Q in is equal to Q out there is no loss of charge that is what it means by a. Uh, so, basically it is like a perfect oscillator or you know the swing or a spring whatever there is no damping in the system there is no loss. So, there is no loss in the system which means it is a perfect dielectric, but life is far from being perfect there is no dielectric which is perfect. So, as a result you have losses in the uh, in every system. And so, when you have losses in every system how do we uh, depict it anyway it was necessary to show how a perfect dielectric would look like, uh, so that we have something to uh, something a ref as a reference. But let us see now how the behavior of real, real dielectrics look like. So, real dielectrics now so real dielectrics under alternating field. So, as I said in real dielectrics generally what will happen is that 
as I so if you if you make a phasor diagram let us say and these phasor diagrams are very useful. So, let us say this is real this is imaginary. Okay. So, we draw a voltage in this as, a, as we said that for a real dielectric for a ideal dielectric the I must be equal to I must be perpendicular to V. So, this is I this is V I C okay. is for a real dielectric. So, I C is equal to I total for a ideal dielectric all right. Now, let us say for a real dielectric the situation is something like this the current is at certain so the, and this uh, this angle is 90 degree by the way. So, for a real dielectric let us say this is your I total and this is at certain angle theta. So, it has two components the one first component that is parallel to. So, this is the I C component. So, this is charging component and this would be the what we call as loss component. component. So, this is I L. So, it is it's made of two terms one is I C plus second is I L and this is I total and basically this is what is going to give you the voltage and this is what is going to give you the, the current on this side. So, let us see so, basically what happens in real dielectrics is uh, in addition to so, I C will be the charging current, I L will be the loss current and this loss is basically it happens because of various nature various things it could happen because of ohmic conduction of charges. In addition, you may also have frequency dependent uh, losses. Okay. So, ohmic conduction means there is no frequency dependence because it is in phase. So, generally ohmic component of the loss is depicted as frequency independent component of loss. But in addition to frequency independent uh, loss, there is a possibility of frequency dependent losses such as you know dipoles rotate in a system and the dipoles rotate in the system they consume energy you may have traps in the system, you may have defective charges in the system which may keep the dipoles bound. For example, if you have grain boundaries, grain boundaries have positive and negative charges, they have certain defects. These defects may pin down the dipoles, the dipoles may require more energy to dominate, to rotate or the, the amount of charges that you have stored that you have stored as a result of when you apply voltage, you, you create the movement of charges. But these, these defects the extra charges which are there in the system they may trap the charges that. So, you said that for a re, for a ideal you know q in it was equal to q out during charging discharging cycle. But if this is not equal to q in and q out which means this some delta q it could either get lost because of ohmic processes or it could get lost because of frequency dependent phenomena. So, you have both the components of loss current. So, that is what we will see in the uh, in our analysis. So, let us say we have both the current both the uh, contributions. So, we have I total this will have I charging I loss some of this component will be frequency ohmic and some of this could be non ohmic and frequency dependent. So, this is frequency independent okay. so, or time dependent you can say I total. So, let us say if uh, 
So, the loss current in these systems is given as what we call as G omega AC plus G TC into V and since both of these are in phase with the applied field uh, that uh, this is th that is why it is called as loss current and this G is basically called as conductance. So, this is basically written in either Mo or Siemens and this is nothing but inverse of resistance right. We know that V is equal to I R. So, it is nothing but inverse of resistance. Okay, so, the total current as a result I t is sum of charging and loss current and this is equal to I c plus I l and this is equal to. So, I c was I omega c plus now G omega a c plus G d c into V. This is what total current is and here this uh, this this so this angle as we say um, this angle is often I have written theta you can also write as delta in some language and this is basically this delta is called as dissipation. factor. So, you can see that if you if you look at this delta uh, this will become 90 minus uh, delta. So, tan of 90 minus delta will be equal to uh, I loss divided by I. Uh, so, basically you can say that this angle will be here you can say the loss angle. higher the loss angle is more the loss current will be right. So, let us say if this was equal to some angle uh, let us say sorry um, let us say if we do not write it as delta we write this as 10 minus 90 minus theta let us say we write this as delta then this tan delta will be equal to I L divided by I C and uh, more the loss in the system higher the tan delta will be for that system or the more the power is dissipated or lost charges are lost. Okay. So, we will do uh, and if you have this as 0 which means there is no loss in the system. So, we will do more analysis of this in the next class we are now running out of time. So, uh, this has this require this will give lead us to what we uh, may expect as frequency dependent of permittivity as we will see later on. Okay. Thank you.